so Matthew chapter five through seven is a sermon that Jesus gave. And I'm simply elaborating on this sermon that Jesus already gave. And a lot of the sermon has been a lot about our actions. Today is more of some comfort that Jesus wants you to receive. We'll be in Matthew 7, 7 through 11. All right, I'm going to pray. Uh, dear Jesus, we thank you that you are here. We thank you that you care. And God, we just pray you'd bless this time, that you'd prevent distractions. God, we just want you to be the focus of our attention right now and every day, God. We thank you that you're here. And God, we just, somehow, we just ask that you somehow speak through me. Amen. Why do melons have weddings? Because they can't elope. What kind of music do chiropractors like? Hip hop. I got a bunch here, okay. Why did the scarecrow win an award? He was outstanding in his field. How do you weigh a millennial in Instagrams? Did you hear about the kidnapping at school? It's fine, he woke up. What did the drummer call his two twin daughters? Anna one, Anna two. How does a penguin build his house? It glues it together. What's Forrest Gump's Wi-Fi password? One, Forrest, one. How many t tickles, how many tickles does it take to make an octopus laugh? Ten tickles. How does the moon cut his hair? Eclipse it. How much does it cost Santa to park his sleigh? Nothing. It's on the house. Want to hear a joke about construction? I'm still working on it. When does a joke become a dad joke? When it becomes a parent. Dad jokes. Dads and their jokes. Wearing their New Balance shoes, their jorts, tucked in shirts, hair to the side. I'm describing my dad. Talking about their lawn, also talking about their neighbor's lawn and comparing it. The weather, their, their boat, sitting in their recliner watching the news, and taking your mom out to Chili's on a Friday night. You may be thinking, how do I even approach this guy? What do we have in common? What do we even talk about? You might be thinking like, okay, Boomer, how can I even relate to my dad at all? Maybe you didn't have the stereotypical middle-class fancy dad. Maybe your father was different. Maybe your father was toxic. Maybe he was not a good father. Maybe he was demanding. Maybe he was abusive. Maybe you lived in fear of your father. Maybe your father was absent. He was always working. He provided for you, but you just had no relationship. It wasn't, maybe it wasn't good or bad. There was just no depth to it. You were, you were roommates, essentially. Maybe you've never met your father. You grew up living with your mom. You get the occasional phone call, letter, or a birthday or Christmas present sent from him. Maybe you hate your father. Or maybe you feel like he hates you. And you have these same questions about your not good father. How do, how do I even approach, approach my dad? How do I even start a conversation with my dad? What do we have in common? How do I even relate to him? At this point in life, is it even worth it to have a better relationship with my father? And maybe you feel this way about your heavenly dad, your heavenly father as well. How do I even approach God? What do we even talk about? Maybe you hate God, or you feel like God hates you. Maybe you feel like God is absent. Maybe you feel like you don't have a connection. How can us, how can we have a better relationship with God? Is it even worth it at this point? How do we approach our heavenly dad? That is the question. How do we approach our heavenly dad? So in Matthew 7, 7 through 11, Jesus, who is God, is telling us, telling us how to approach him. How do we communicate 
and have a relationship with our heavenly dad. So when we approach each other, we walk up to each other and we talk and we listen. It's called a conversation or talking story. When we approach God, we talk and we listen and we call it prayer. So prayer is approaching God and talking and listening. It's like when we have conversations with each other, it's having a conversation with God, talking story. So in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, it's a sermon that Jesus gave. And Jesus already talked about prayer in Matthew 6. John gave a sermon right here six weeks ago about prayer. So why are we talking about prayer again? In Jesus' sermon, why does he talk about prayer again? Because in Matthew 6, he talked about the Lord's Prayer. He told us this is a good example of how we can pray. And he said there's no need to bring long prayers or really elaborate, fancy, like Christianese words. God says you can just pray simply to him, and he hears you. So why does Jesus bring up prayer again today, a second time? It's because Jesus wants you to know that he is approachable. And in Matthew 7, 7 through 11, there are two simple main truths about Jesus being approachable. So let's read Matthew 7, 7 through 11. 7, 11. I'll be reading through the New International Version today. Matthew 7, 7, 11. All right, it says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So the first truth that Jesus wants you to know about prayer is that your heavenly dad wants to hear your voice. Your heavenly dad wants to hear your voice. So just like your parents may be the people that you leave on red the longest, God is often the person that we leave on red the longest as well. God is texting you, calling you, reminding you of his love, but we're like used to it and it looks like we don't care and we're very complacent to reply. And we know like in, in your parents' dream, in your parents' dream, you would live right across the street from them. You'd hang out every single day. You'd talk all the time. You'd reply to their texts right away. And this is God's desire for you too because God loves you even more than that. In these verses 7 through 11, it's an invitation to talk story with God. A link to a Zoom call with your heavenly dad. Your heavenly dad is saying, ask me for things. Seek me. Knock on my door. I'm approachable. I'm available. Come be with me. Let's hang out. Let's live life together. He wants you to want him. And a relationship has two sides. Two people need to want a relationship for it to even happen or even to work. And God wants you to desire him as well. In James 4, 2, it says you do not have because you do not ask God. You know, you have not because you ask not. You might know that one. We may think, like, why pray? Like, aren't things just going to happen like they are anyway? But God is powerful and God is in control. He knows what's going to happen. But through prayer, we can help make it happen. Because we don't know what our future holds, but we know who holds our future. God does. And we have direct access to him. The all-powerful, loving God is asking you to ask him for things. He wants you to bring his re your requests to him. Our God is powerful and your prayers are powerful. And we can humbly, humbly bring requests to God because he is a loving God. He is inviting you to ask. And God invites you to seek. And what we are seeking is him. In Matthew 6, 33, like Michael shared, it says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. 
we aren't seeking the blessings, we're seeking Jesus. And when we do that, he promises he will always provide for you. And it's not like God is playing hide and go seek with you because he's not hiding from you. He has made himself known in the Bible. He has made himself known through this beautiful creation that we live in. And he makes himself known through friends and anyone who speaks the name of Jesus to you. God is here. You do not have to try to find him because he has found you. And he wants you to know today that he is approachable. God invites you to seek him, to get to know him more and more, to have a deeper and deeper relationship with him. And God invites you to knock on his door. So when you knock, you, you don't just knock once. Have you ever knocked once? No, no, who knocks once? Like. It's usually like three or four knocks, yeah? Who's, like, who's a three knock person? Three knocks. F four knocks? Okay, mo mostly three knocks over here. Okay, so knocking shows that God wants persistent and consistent communication with you. He does not just want one knock a month or one knock per week on a Sunday when we just like prayed a couple times. He wants you to knock every single day because he loves you and he loves to have connection with you. And he says, don't just ask me once, ask me all the time because you trust me and you know that I will provide for you. Maybe you feel, maybe you feel close to your heavenly dad, like he's right next to you. So you can just like ask him. Maybe you feel a little distant from God, where you have to go like seek him. Maybe you feel like there's barriers between you and God. You have to try to knock them down. No matter how you feel, you can know 100% that God is with us right now. God is with you every day. And if you are a Christian, if you've surrendered your life to Jesus, God lives inside of you. He's not leaving you. He won't forsake you. God is on your side, and your heavenly dad wants you to know that he is approachable and cares about your life. He loves to hear your voice. He loves it when you ask, seek, and knock, because he wants you to want him. And the second simple truth that God wants you to know about prayer is your heavenly dad loves to care for you. Like we know this, yeah, but your heavenly dad wants you to know that he cares for you. So when my parents come visit my house, I clean it up super nice. I make sure everything is spick and span and organized. Nothing's wrong here, everything's great. Everything's in order, but Every single time my dad finds like the one thing that I didn't clean, every single time he's super organized and he is constantly cleaning my house. I'm like, how did you even find these things? He's fixing things, he's repairing things. I was totally okay with not being re repaired. He'll pay for all of my meals, which is great. He'll buy me new dish tolls, like every time. And he'll leave giving me a full tank of gas in my car. Dad things, yeah? Dad things. His parenting instinct kicks in. He's like, I must provide. Like, I must provide. You know dads, yeah? Even though I'm 29, I'm still his child. And God, God provides for us even better than our dads do. In verse 11, it says, If you, then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him. So if your earthly dad is this great, your heavenly dad is even better. Way, 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 way better. You cannot even imagine how great your heavenly dad is. And, you know, I don't, I don't even ask my dad to clean or buy me anything. He just does it anyway. And even when we do not ask, seek, or knock, God will still be providing for you because he loves you that much. But God wants you to ask, seek, and knock because he wants to be more and more a part of your life if you'll let him in. And God wants to provide and bless you more and more and more. Do you want to just receive the blessings 
that he will give you, or do you want to ask and seek and knock for those blessings that he's asking you to ask for? So will God always give you exactly what you ask for? No, but he promises it will be good. If you ask for bread, he's not going to trick you and give you a stone. If you ask for fish, he's not going to give you a snake. In, in Luke 11, it talks about the same thing. It says, if you ask for eggs, he's not going to give you a scorpion. So like bread, fish, and eggs are very good compared to stones, snakes, and scorpions. But that doesn't necessarily mean God will always give you exactly what you ask for. But this is often how we treat God. We often treat God like a fast food drive through We declare, we decree, we claim, I will order this food. If they gave you something different, we would not be happy. If you asked for bread, fish and eggs, and you got a tortilla, pork and cheese, you would be irate. You would go in, you'd walk right in there, you'd show them the receipt, and you would complain horribly. This is often how we view God. This is not how God works. We cannot name it because we cannot claim it because God will always give you what's best, and maybe that Kahlua pork quesadilla is way, way better than those chicken strips you asked for. Jesus could have used a more certainty, like a more for sure language. He could have used some language, like when you pay for something, you'll own it. That's for sure. If you look at something, you'll see it. If you push something, it'll fall over. Those are like certainties, but Jesus did not use that language here. It shows that prayer is not completely in our control. It's only half of it. So when you ask for something, the other, other person still has to grant you a request. When you seek someone's attention, they have to want to give you their attention. When you knock on a door, someone has to answer it. Asking, seeking, and knocking are all actions that we are not in complete control of. God is in complete control of. God won't always give you exactly what you want, but he will 100% always give you exactly what you need, and that is always what is best for you, and you can trust that. And sometimes you will get exactly what you ask for, and that's not because you deserve it. It's because that is what was best and because it's a gift. And if you don't get exactly what you asked for, that's not your fault. Um, verse 8 says, for everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. Everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Everyone. So God's responsiveness to prayer is not based on your goodness. It's based on his goodness. So God's responsiveness to your prayers is not based on the goodness of the one who asks and the goodness of our good heavenly dad. And we have a good, good father. He'll either answer with a yes, a no, or I have something better in mind for you. First John 5.14 says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. Approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So if we are seeking God, like Michael was talking about, we're seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness, growing in our relationship with him, his desires will become our desires. And that is the best place to be. We'll begin to naturally ask for what he wants, because that's what we want. We'll ask for things that bring our heavenly dad glory. We'll ask for from good motivations of loving him, loving others, and making disciples. And we'll keep on knocking because we'll keep on trusting him and wanting and wanting more and more of a constant relationship with him. When you have submitted your desires to God's desires, you will be happy with what he gives you, whether or not that is originally what you asked for. Because you know he is good and you trust that what he gives you is always what is best for you. And Romans 8.28 says, And we know that in all things, all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according 
to his purpose. And in conclusion, your heavenly dad is no joke. He wants you to know that he is approachable. He loves to hear your voice. He wants you to want him. He wants you to love him. He wants you to desire him because he loves you and he desires you. He cares for you. And God loves to provide for you. In verse 11, Matthew 7, 11, it says that we are evil, but yet we are his children. That does not make sense. But to God, it makes perfect sense. This is salvation. Jesus is our Savior. This is the good news that we don't deserve God's goodness, but God is so, so good to us. And our heavenly dad did not just love us one time on the cross. He loves you every single day. The good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ is for you every single day. His promises are true for you every single day. The Bible does not change. It stays the same. And those words, those promises for you are true. God is appro approachable. Your heavenly dad is approachable. And he wants you to come, sit down, talk story, and live life with him. He's, he's waiting for you. And he promises that he will always be with you. Let's pray. Dear Dad, we thank you that you are good. We thank you that we can trust you. God, we thank you that when we ask for things, we know that you will always give us what is best. God, we thank you that you're approachable and you care about every single thing about us. And God, this week as we live our life, God, I pray that we choose to walk right next to you. And God, we thank you for who you are and what you do. Amen.